Good afternoon, everybody. As Harriet has just told you, we're current students on the Masters in Science Communication here at Imperial College. We were tasked with the uh, task of coming here today to talk to you about an area of science communication that has particularly interested us. We put our heads together and we thought the part of the course that's really interested us this term and has stuck in our minds has been the way that our perceptions of science have been challenged, the way we see science as a subject and we, how we see it standing in society. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a couple of talks this afternoon, quite short, um, covering two different areas. And me, Becky and Matilda are going to start by saying, controversially, what is so great about science? You may have seen that you've been given a red and green card as you came into the room. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I want to sort of judge what the room's ideas are. Some of you will have very set views on how you see science, and some of you probably haven't really thought about science as a subject much before at all. Um, so what I want you to do is, when I ask the questions, put up your red card if you think the answer is no, and put up your green card if you think the answer is yes. Pretty straightforward. OK, these are, it'll be interesting to see what you think. So, to start with, does science have a universal method? What do you think about that? I've got a few cards going up. Ooh, that's good. That's good. That's more interesting than I thought it would be. There's quite a lot of red cards up. Secondly, does science uncover fundamental truths? Yeah, a bit more green heavy. Good. Okay. And... Is science special compared to other academic disciplines? <laughs> okay, a bit of a split across the room there. And finally, should science's standing in society be argued for or assumed? Oh, no, that's not a question where you can have a yes or no answer, is it? No. <laughs> what did I write? Yeah. Rather than. Rather than assumed. So should it be argued for, basically? Because at the moment we're saying perhaps we assume it. So should science's standing in society be argued for rather than, rather than assumed? Brilliant. OK. I like your thinking. OK. So now I'm going to pass over to Becky and Matilda. They are going to carry out a little debate and we're going to look into the idea, is there or isn't there a scientific method? OK. Thank you. Yeah. So before we start our debate, one of the reasons why people think science is different to other forms of knowledge is because of the scientific method. So before we kind of launch into it, I'd like you all to think, what do you think is the scientific method? Could you define it in one sentence? And would anyone like to share what they think the scientific method is? Yep, yeah, I'm just going to go to people near the front because it's nice and easy. Let's see if I can, um, right, observe a phenomenon, come up with a hypothesis as to what you're observing and then test it. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, brilliant. Um, that's quite similar to what I thought when I was asked this question at the beginning of the year. <laughs> um, but I'm going to challenge that, and I'm going to argue today that there is no such thing as a scientific method, that science might be perceived as being a rational, logical approach and uncovering fundamental truths about our world, but when you actually look at it, scientific knowledge is made in irrational and unconventional ways. And I'm going to completely disagree and defend the method that you described. <laughs> Bring it on. Right. So to start at the very beginning, we usually refer to Sir Francis Bacon as the father of modern science. And quite rightly so, because before Bacon, there really wasn't such a thing as science at all. The way that we interpreted the world was based around religious teachings or natural philosophy come straight out of the works of Aristotle. And during the Enlightenment, Bacon's time, people really started to think for themselves and to use reason and logic to answer questions about nature. This was the birth of science. It brought the sciences beyond the realms of philosophical conjecture and into the subject that we actually study today. Yeah, so Bacon was the one to highlight the importance of the scientific method. But when you look at it, the method he outlined is not quite right. He said that our theories should be based on observations of the world around us. And from these observations, we could draw out general rules. So the classic example is, think about swans. And let's say we, we meet 100 swans, and every swan we meet, we observe that that swan is white. We can then draw out the general rule that all swans are white, and this is our law. But this is not a rational approach, because it relies on the fundamental assumption that things in the future, that future swans we meet, will be the same as things have already been in the past. 
It only takes one black swan to topple this law that we that we draw and this fundamental truth. And how can we rely on a method that is so easily toppled? How can we say it gives us a rational truth when really it's just a leap of faith? Bacon's method was quite flawed, yes, but it was still certainly an improvement on the church doctrine. And there have been further improvements to the method in recent years. Take Karl Popper, for example. Hey. Um, Party Popper. Yeah. Um, but people call him the scientist philosopher, and he was all for a science that progressed through the elimination of error. Um, he tried to fix some problems with Bacon's method through his concept of falsification. This means formulating a hypothesis and um, that can be conceivably proved wrong by an experiment. For Popper, a theory is not scientific unless it can be proven wrong. So you have your theory, you test it, and then you test it again. And then you keep testing it until it's either been proven wrong and falsified and thrown out, or it looks strong enough to stand up and the rest of the scientific community will agree with it. What really separates science is its ability to see its own faults and to adjust itself accordingly. And with this method, we can be pretty sure that science gives us the knowledge that we can trust. But is this actually a description of how science is done? In an ideal world, of course, we, it might allow us to generate facts that we're pretty sure of, but I don't know any scientists who go around trying to prove their own theories wrong. No, you're searching for evidence to prove yourself right, to get funding to build on your idea, not to prove yourself wrong. No, scientists don't spend their entire lives trying to prove themselves wrong. I mean, who would really? But they do listen to each other. And if new reliable evidence occurs to show that their theories are false, then they'll adjust them accordingly. Even so, this method... I think, relies on a highly idealised assumption that all scientists are going to behave in a certain way and stick to a code of conduct similar to the one that Merton outlined in his norms. He describes scientists as sharing all of their results, never being swayed by bias towards an institution or someone's reputation, not being motivated by self-interest, and always being sceptical, scrutinising scientific claims before accepting them. I think this is a common perception that that's how science should be done. And it would be really nice, but it's not realistic. There are countless examples of great scientists who've won their Nobel Prizes through their ego, their ambition, by breaking the rules, or by sticking to their guns when all the evidence of the time said that they were wrong. Instead of scepticism, we see Mitroff's anti-norm of dogmatism. For example, both Newton and Galileo, who I'm sure you'll agree are great scientists, founders of their field, they both fudged their calculations at points. Galileo used the tide as proof that Earth moves around the sun, but his calculations said there should only be one tide a day. And he lived in Venice, so he should probably have known there are two tides. He just chose to ignore inconvenient data. We also see secrecy, such as the competitive race to uncover the structure of DNA, where Rosalind Franklin's pictures were shown to Watson and Crick without her permission and gave them the inspiration they need, needed sorry, to discover the secret of life. Our knowledge of neurotransmitters, ooh, not those, <laughs> which are the chemicals that pass between our nerves, our knowledge of that came from an experiment designed entirely in a dream. And the PCR reaction, which helps us to study genetics, was inspired by an LSD trip. There are many more examples where science has not adhered to the methods and principles that we think it should do or think it does. How can this affect our idea of science and the scientific method? Can we really trust in a process which is so different from our expectations of it? But most scientists do stick to the method. The mavericks are the ones that you will have heard of because they make for a better story, and we have moved on a lot since Galileo. I don't suppose most of the scientists here at Imperial like to think they spend their time swallowing around breaking all of the rules. But often, great discoveries are made by outsiders, and maybe that's because they haven't had scientific training. They can see things in a different way because they're not trying to stick to some ideal method. I take Edison, one of the great inventors. He gave us electricity. He was homeschooled by his mother and never had any formal scientific training. Edison was one in a million. Most, if not all, of the most important discoveries have been made by scientists going about their work properly and methodically. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that work is done as prescribed by Merton and by Popper. Look at the Crick Institute, a whole building designed for interdisciplinary collaboration and a perfect example of Merton's norm of communalism. And look at CERN, thousands of scientists working together from hundreds of different nationalities, all for the sake of the pursuit of knowledge. This is exactly what Merton meant by universalism. Even if not at an individual level, as you have described, um, at a societal level, we do pull each other up and help each other out and stick to codes of conduct. 
Most scientists do stick to the rules and want each other to do the same. So if we see people cherry-picking data or fudging their statistics, then we'll call them out on it, or at the very least, Ben Goldacre will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this still doesn't convince me that we can fully believe the knowledge produced is true. The scientific method is all about being objective, observing phenomenon and letting the facts speak for themselves. But are the truths and facts really as objective as we want them to be? So, Becky, I would like you to take 10 seconds and just observe, and then you're going to tell me what you observe. And everyone in the room, you should do this as well. Just observe, see what you observe. 10 seconds. I think that was a sufficiently long and awkward enough pause. So, Becky, what have you observed? Well, we're in a lecture theatre full of people. That light over there is exceedingly blinding. Um, what sort of thing did you want me to observe? Okay, so why, why did you pick on visual things? Why did you think about what was in the room rather than the sounds? You see, in order to know what to observe, you have to know what's important. You have to have a theory in your head already, which points you in the right direction. You can't... Sorry. Uh, that theory is influenced by your context and everything around you. Hardly an objective approach. And if we don't have an objective, rational, logical method, how can we say that science is different to any other form of knowledge? But you're saying where these ideas come from, and that doesn't stop science from being a method. Theory-laden or not, observation is still observation, and that is the grounding of the scientific method. And while we're at it, does it really matter if our worldviews let us get things a little bit wrong from time to time? Is a wrong theory really wrong as long as it's useful? I mean, look at Newton's theory of gravity that was pushed out by Einstein's. It still has very powerful predictive properties. And what really matters is that science works. It does what it says on the tin. And if you want any proof of that, just look at the building that you're sitting in or at the phone in your pocket. Science doesn't just have a method. Science is a method. And there's no point claiming to be a scientist doing science if you're not going to go about your work methodically and properly. Science isn't a what, it's a how, and that how is the scientific method. Okay, but I'm going to take the microphone back now. So, perhaps a better way to look at this is to come somewhere in the middle. Could I give you the clicker? Is that right? Uh, I shall tell you. Okay, so we're going to rework this extreme idea that we as now sociology students have come in and proposed that there exists no universal scientific method whatsoever. I'd say instead, like someone like Chalmers did, that there are methods and practices within science. These vary between science, and within a science can be changed. As Becky has said, from around us here, we can see that science demonstrably works. It produces solutions to problems. If we think of science as an open-ended quest to improve knowledge, it kind of seems counterintuitive to try and fix its, uh, the way we talk about it in fixed terms. The way we learn science, our findings, they will continue to evolve, and therefore, our thinking about it should continue to evolve. The common perception that scientific method is a large part of what constitutes science needs questioning. The discipline of science is more complex and nuanced than a simple method alone. And more importantly, as we have heard, it's practiced by people. Scientists are humans in a context influenced by the things around them. And we're going to look at that a little bit in a bit more detail now. No. <laughs> Okay, um, Matilda talked about Bacon and his idea that we carefully and accurately make observations and these lead to theories. Um, it's commonly presumed that scientific observations are objective, as Matilda said, but they're still made by human eyes, collected by human hands, and the important ones are selected by human brains. Is it possible for a normal person to be totally objective? And by that I mean free from their own feelings and their interpretations. So what I was going to do was show you a slide. And, well, you can see this slide. I want you to shout out what, what it is you see. What do you see in this slide? Good, good. We still got a variation of results. <laughs> oh, controversial. Yeah, okay. So, as you could all hear, we got a variation between people shouting out it was a duck or people shouting out it was a rabbit. Mostly, I'm going to say that when you saw the picture, you saw one or the other. You saw a duck or a rabbit. You didn't think, oh, am I, what? Maybe? Well, however, the, what we're going to say is, oh, I also want to say, put up your hands at the back if you saw a rabbit. Well, I can't really do that scientifically, but I basically tried in some sort of Darren Brown-esque way to influence your context to see if that would influence and 
make a lot of you think that you saw a rabbit. I might have placed a few pictures of rabbits at the back end. I don't think it was very successful. Basically trying to illustrate the point that if you are in a context where something is thought about, then you may see a picture in a certain way. So this whole idea illustrates um, an idea that was put forward by Wittgenstein and developed by Hansen, that observation does not come before theory. Theory comes before observation. Um, we don't interpret this image as a rabbit or a duck. We see it, and he would say that those things were separate. For instance, if I showed you the next picture. Oh, this was just illustrating our point that in those two circumstances, the image looks quite different. There we go, that's the picture we're after. If you're not a, bio a biologist or come from a biology background, you may see this picture as some sort of bizarre tray for making ice or just a weird plastic tray. If you come from a biology background, you may in fact see that it's a piece of specialist equipment for doing a bioassay. So that... <laughs> uh, but what we're basically saying is that in science, we need frameworks to understand the novel things we're looking at. If we say that observation is theory-laden, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Theory may just simply be something that we can recognize and then reject. However, the point of thinking about these concepts is to understand that science is fundamentally a human endeavor, and as such, it encompasses our perceptions of the world. The, um, the point of raising such issues isn't to undermine the importance of science. Instead, we believe that it's important to consider that some ideas that are fed to us about why science is unique need questioning, just as with any subject in society that has great influence. As a democracy, we should question it. And that's exactly what science is. It is part of society and one that shouldn't consider itself removed if it wants its findings to be taken on board by the public. Okay, so that's our little bit from us about uh, why is science great. And what I'm going to pass on now, we're going to look a little bit more into the language of science and that's influence on our perceptions. Hi, okay, so we've just heard Kat questioning whether scientists or anyone can see the world as it really is. So what we perceive is kind of built upon our individual past experiences, which are necessarily different for all of us. So we're now going to think a little bit about how our culture and language affect the way we see the world. And so one area people have tried to look at the influence of culture and language on is our perception of colours. So I know I've thought before, um, are people seeing the same color as I am if they call something, say, red or blue? How do I know that what we're seeing is the same? And more specifically, does the way we classify and define colors, so through the language we use to talk about them, actually influence what we're seeing? So I'm going to tell you about an experiment that was shown on BBC Horizon a couple of years ago, and the documentary followed a researcher who went to see the Himba people in northern Namibia. And the reason these people were important for this experiment was the way the Himba language defines color is very different to the way the Western language does. So, for example, we can see that in English, we have 11 basic color categories, whereas in Himba, we have only five, which you can see here. And the crucial difference is that if we look, we can see that greens and blues fall into the same color category. So there isn't a separate word for them both, so they're not distinguishing between blue and green. However, we've got different shades of greens do have a different word, so they're being distinguished between. So the way the experiment worked was that people were shown 12 colored squares and asked to identify which square was a different color to the rest. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, can you guys see which square is the different color to the others? Any guesses? Okay, so I, so I guess what we've learned is it's, it's not easy, right? <laughs> so actually the different one is that one. I can show you the, uh, the color RGB codes if you'd like. <laughs> Yeah, but so what's interesting is that when the Himba people were shown this, they were actually slightly quicker and less likely to make mistakes than when Western people carried out the same experiment. Whereas if they were shown an image like this, which hasn't come out very well, but I'm hoping you can maybe see there one that's obviously different to the others. So there's a blue one at kind of nine o'clock. 
So the Himba people were actually much slower at telling which one was the odd color out. And so the researchers believe this is due to this language difference. So there's no distinction in their language between blue and green. So they find it harder to distinguish between the two colors. So does this mean that the words we use are actually affecting our perception of the world? And if this is true, what does it mean for value-free science? The idea that we can directly observe the world and objectively describe it. Could our culture and language actually be affecting the development of scientific knowledge and the way it's communicated? And so I'm going to use an example of how our language and culture has actually affected scientific research. Um, and for that, I'm going to turn to the field of genetics. Um, as most of you will probably agree, that it ha genetics has uh, amazing power um, in science, in contemporary science, and obviously controlling biological traits. Um, that's not what I was expecting, but we'll roll with it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as, oh, that's put me off a little bit, sorry. They, um, so, these, as genetics is, um, as most of us would argue, um, the fundamental goal for biological um, sciences, uh, it would, you'd think that when we were naming such a subject, we would, um, consult several different teams, um, several different peer-reviewed papers just to um, allow it for a name or to discover a name for it. But what actually happened, if you read the works of Evelyn Fox Keller, she um, said that it was only one group of people that gave this name to the genetics, and that was the Morganian um, School of Genetics in America. The, um, so when we look at the name of a thing, we realize that once you've assigned this name, the amount of interpretation that follows afterwards um, is huge. And in the case of genetics, we had this one quite casually assigned name, but that shaped a huge amount of the way that we talk, the way that we write, um, and the way that we think about genetics in this sense. Um, in fact, she gives some examples that um, it gave them a way of defining um, the way that they could approach their research, the way that they carried out the research itself and the questions that they asked. Um, and also the kinds of organisms that they could study. So, um, in a way, by giving it this name and by assigning just one name to it, it became, the name was used so repeatedly that it became entrenched within our scientific language and our scientific knowledge. And there's another um, way from a wider linguistic theory that this is done uh, and the way that we communicate science, and that's through the use of metaphor. And I'm going to try now... Um, and show you just how much some of the words that we use and take as everyday ways of describing science uh, have become so entrenched that are actually so far removed from the idea. Um, I hope this is going to work. <laughs> so what I want you to do is I'm going to put a, a, a word up on the board and I want you to sort of shout out the first thing that comes into your head. It doesn't have to be scientific. It could be anything related to that word. So the first one is pump. Right. <laughs> So there we go, we had one heart, but most of you jumped to a different conclusion, didn't you? Um, sorry? Blood. Oh, blood, sorry. Right. Um, and it, this goes to show that the, the language that we actually use to describe a lot of science might not actually, in relation to a wider linguistic field, have any relation to science. So we're just going to go through a few more. And the next one is war. <laughs> so none of you thought about a war on illness or um, the way that we... Combat viruses. Ooh. Well, dip. <laughs> well, <laughs> computer. <laughs> yeah. Crashing. Okay, technical issues. I'll give you that one. So, the brain. The next one is code. A lot of computer programming there, but uh, how we describe the genetic code. And our final one is unzip. Yeah, so no one thought about the DNA strand there, did they? Um, <laughs> and so this is just a sort of brief introduction to show you how much metaphor has impregnated our scientific language. Um, and to give you a better idea of what metaphor is and uh, how it's used, um, perhaps in policy, is Lillianne. Hi, yeah, so you can see we use metaphors in science all the time, and to a certain extent, they can be really useful. They can help describe um, scientific concepts that might be a little bit difficult to understand. Yeah, thank you. That might be a little bit difficult to understand or might be a little bit abstract. 
So saying that a mitochondria, what's a mitochondria? It is, yep, the metaphor we often use is it's the battery or the powerhouse of a cell. Does anyone uh, know what metaphor we often use for DNA? It's the code for life. Um, and they both help try and convey that essential characteristic that might otherwise be quite difficult to visualize or understand. And it's not just to students or to members of the public that scientists are using metaphors. They're using them all the time to each other. When a scientist says that they've detected some noise, they're not usually literally hearing noise in the lab. They might be looking at a graph like that. When they say they are, looking, they are looking into the evolutionary tree of something, they don't literally mean they think there's a tree that all this life has sprouted off of. And when they are investigating string theory, they don't get out a massive ball of string like this fella. I don't know, do they? <laughs> um, but we do have to be really careful how we use metaphors, because they can have unintended consequences. They can have different meanings to what we expect, or we can use them so often we forget it's even a metaphor. Take black holes, for example. That name really conveys the idea that it's something that stops light and matter, but actually it's not a hole. It's a small object with a large gravitational field, and I apologize if I've got that definition slightly wrong. Um, but in this sense, you can see that it's it is slightly misleading because it's not a hole. Did anyone notice the metaphor that I subconsciously used that I didn't even register was a metaphor? No, it is quite difficult to work out. No, it was field, gravitational field. Um, so it was actually introduced in the 19th century by the British because they were really proud of having invented magnets and all their discoveries in electricity. Um, and field had really positive connotations. They were, um, they were proud of their farming heritage, their sports, and of course, winning lots of wars at that time. Um, so that's why they gave it the name field and it's stuck. We don't even think it's a metaphor anymore. So you might think, why does it matter? Who cares if someone thinks our oh, black hole is a hole, or for that matter, that the Big Bang was actually a big bang, when in fact no one knows if it was a bang, and it probably didn't start off very big, even though it got that way. Well, firstly, as um, we've kind of explained, language can shape our perceptions of the world around us. And um, as Will said, it can shape the direction of a research field. So. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer here, but maybe if we have a bad metaphor and we take it the wrong way, does that influence the way that we then go on to research something? If we think that genes are literally the only thing, the code for life, the essential bit that makes us who we are, does that mean that other mechanisms that might also be really important aren't given enough recognition and as much research time and money as they would otherwise be? Secondly, um, and just to finish up, I'm going to look at how um, an example we looked at in class of how metaphors um, and other language can influence the way that policymakers and members of the public actually view science issues in the press. So we looked at, um, we looked at foot and mouth disease, and I apologize for the picture coming up in a moment. I'll keep it on the cat for now. Um, Foot and mouth disease, most of you will probably remember, was a viral disease which affects animals like cows. And when it broke out in 2001 in Britain, the policy response was um, to burn any infected animal and any animals in the nearby area to try and um, limit the spread of the infection. As Will mentioned, we often think of diseases as an invading force. It's a fight against disease. It's a war. And I'm not here to argue whether culling was a good or bad decision. That's not why I'm here at all. I'm just saying that talking about foot and mouth disease as a war, as was often said in the press, helped make that decision to, um, to burn the animals a little bit more acceptable, a little bit less controversial than it would otherwise be if we'd said lots of nice things about those poor, sick animals. As, as, as with the rest of the talk, there is no right or wrong answer, and you probably have your own views. It's quite an extreme example. 
but it does make pictures like that seem a little bit less controversial than if a different headline was up there. So thank you for listening. We hope, um, we hope that we've... Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the end bit is the one you don't remember, isn't it? Um, you might, overall, we just wanted to give you some food to thought on how language can shape our perceptions of the world around us, including what we usually call science. Thank you. Thank you.